third installment now in uh, the first year of the Nathanson Center's Emerging Trends um, in Criminal Justice Seminar Series that's organized by myself, um, Heidi Matthews, and Professors Pachoco and Tongay Renault. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome as our speaker uh, for this third talk, Lisa Kelly, who is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at Queen's University, uh, where she teaches in the areas of criminal law and evidence. Uh, her research lies at the intersection of criminal law and family law with a focus on historical and contemporary legal regulation of sex, reproduction, and family life. Professor Kelly completed her doctorate at Harvard Law School in 2015, where she was a Trudeau scholar. Uh, before joining Queen's, she was also a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia Law School and the Center for Reproductive Rights in New York City. And, and Professor Kelly has served as a law clerk to Justice Marshall Eve Rothstein of the Supreme Court of Canada and has been a Fulbright Scholar, a Frank Knox Memorial Fellow, and a Fellow of the Institute for, the Global, law, for Global Law and Policy at the Harvard Law School. So welcome, Lisa, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Wonderful. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and thanks especially to uh, Liel Gonzalez, um, who uh, did a lot of groundwork uh, to make this uh, workshop possible. Um, and also, obviously, to the Nathanson Center uh, uh, here at Osgood, uh, including uh, professors Francois Tongay Renault, uh, Palma Pachaco, and um, Professor Heidi Matthews uh, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure um, to be with you all here. Uh, and thanks so much for making time uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, so the title of my talk today is um, Policing Child Discipline. Um, and what I'm going to talk uh, with you about today is um, the decades-long campaign um, that children's rights advocates uh, have pursued in Canada uh, to repeal what you'll see uh, on the slide here uh, of Section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. Um, and according to um, children's rights advocates, the kind of do their dominant position uh, on this provision um, is that it's a holdover um, from a more archaic time when we used to think of children uh, more as akin to chattel property uh, who were subject to the domination of their parents, um, but also of their teachers um, and at one time of their master masters uh, when they served as uh, apprentices or certainly obviously as enslaved uh, people. Um, and what this provision essentially uh, provides is a kind of carve out. Some have framed it as an excuse, others as a justification, but in either case, uh, a kind of carve out defense to the regular law of common assault that would apply uh, in cases when one uh, uses physical force, either hitting, which it's often uh, referred to as, as sometimes uh, controversially as spanking provision, uh, but either hitting in the form of corporal punishment uh, but also to quite a, a degree also even restraint uh, uh, would seem to be uh, at least captured on its face uh, by assault. Um, and so the focus of my talk today uh, when I discuss the campaigns to seek repeal um, is going to be specifically on the way that advocates have mobilized um, social science evidence uh, in their legal and political campaigns. And in particular, um, some of the ethical choices that they have made in deciding what types of social science evidence to draw upon, um, what questions they have asked uh, or obscured. Uh, in pursuing uh, questions about the meaning and the implication of physical discipline, um, and what are some of the implications and the consequence of these choices uh, for us as we think about law and policy reform uh, in this area. Um, so just to get us a little bit of uh, a setup about where this defense comes from, um, it dates back, actually, well predates um, Blackstone, but I'm going to start uh, with um, Blackstone at least as, um, oh, am I missing a page here? No, I'm not. Um, so I'm going to start, though, with Blackstone, who uh, was one of the main figures who informed um, James Fitzjames Stephen, who, whose model penal code, our code, uh, was very much um, based upon. Um, and so for Blackstone, who was writing uh, in the 18th century, um, he understood 
uh, physical discipline or corrective power um, to exist as part of uh, the parents and in particular the father's authority over the child. So as some of you who may or may not have experienced um, Blackstone commentaries at some point uh, in your lives. Um, Blackstone organized um, uh, a lot of law in terms of relations, uh, right? Parent, child, husband, wife. Um, and within the parent-child relationship, um, Blackstone set out, again, in particular, that fathers had per particular duties and responsibilities to their children. Um, these include duties of uh, maintenance, of protection, of education. Uh, and in exchange, or in part in, in allowing them to actually execute those duties, uh, they had certain powers and authorities. So for instance, um, if their child was serving as, as an apprentice, uh, the father had uh, a right to the child's earnings, uh, in part because they had uh, the private responsibility to maintain their child. Um, and likewise, um, Blackstone wrote that the father, quote, may lawfully correct his child being under age in a reasonable manner, um, for this is for the benefit of his education. Um, and this is significant because Blackstone was very much channeling 18th century ideas about the benefits of physical chastisement uh, for the child and for his or her educational and scholarly development, right? There is this close intersection between the parent uh, and the private tutor who likewise um, could be delegated this authority from the parent. Um, but the key part, and I'll return to this a little uh, later toward the end of my talk, is that even for Blackstone at a time when physical discipline held uh, different social meanings uh, than it may in some circles today, um, he still uh, figured the authority in terms of the parents' uh, child-rearing uh, duties and powers, right? Um, it wasn't really a property relation or simply a story of domination or do what you will with your child, which is how it's often narrated backward. I think that's an anachron anachronistic uh, reading. It was really about uh, the way in which parents would fulfill um, their child-rearing responsibilities. So we inherit uh, that law via, through Blackstone, who uh, 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 gives this to James Fitzjames Stevens. Uh, when we codify in 1892, uh, that provision comes in here. It originally also included masters and apprentices. Uh, that relation dropped out when we revised our code in 55. Um, but otherwise, the provision, as you see it here, uh, really came uh, through the common law. And we had it uh, when we codified, as I said, in 1892. Um, so certainly by the, by the 1980s, I would say definitely you started to get more and more uh, advocacy by children's rights groups in Canada, but also in Europe and more globally, arguing against maintaining these exceptional defenses within uh, criminal codes uh, globally and certainly within uh, the common law world. Um, advocates had pursued um, political advocacy, um, certainly into the early 90s uh, through Parliament, and they weren't uh, gaining the political traction that they wanted for repeal. Um, and so eventually they turned their energies, uh, for, at least for a while, away from Parliament and toward um, the courts. And the incident that really sparked off this move to the courts that would culminate in, in what many of you will be familiar with, at least the, the first years will eventually become familiar with it, which will be our Canadian Foundation case. But the incident that really sparked off that litigation was a pretty banal, mundane one. Um, and so I'm going to start us there. So um, uh, this was uh, in 1995, a Labor Day weekend trip. And we can all see uh, the ways in which we have um, these kind of nice um, bourgeois family images in our head of the family road trip. Um, and the Peterson family of Warrenville, Illinois, um, over the Labor Day weekend in 1995, um, decided to sojourn up to the Canadian side, uh, which, you know, is arguably the nicer side, but uh, like also has this bad casino hotel. So it's a bit of a trade off. But they went to the Canadian side uh, and, uh, and, and this was their, their, Labor Day, their Labor Day weekend trip. 
Um, so things, you know, were seemingly going pretty well. But as any of us who have experienced a family road trip, um, things often don't continue to go well for the entire trip. And things went a little south uh, for the Peterson family um, in the parking lot of the Olive Garden. <laughs> Uh, which is where, um, again, um, um, a, a kind of great setting for uh, middle class family drama. Um, so the incident that started it all off was one, again, that will be pretty utterly familiar uh, to many people. Um, two siblings um, were misbehaving in the back seat of the car. They were refusing to listen. Um, the mom had gone into the Olive Garden. It was her birthday. The dad and the kids had gone out to get the surprise birthday cake from the car. The dad puts the two kids in the back of the car. She is aged uh, three. The toddler's about one and a half to two. Uh, the older sister is antagonizing the little guy. The father says, you know, you need to stop, stop, uh, stop hitting him. Um, the back door is open. The car is not moving, but the back door is open. Um, she pushes the one and a half or two year old out the open door. He tries to get back in. She slams the door on his hand. Um, so naturally, there's a lot of shouting. There's a lot of crying. Um, what he did next, though, ended up really dividing Canadians. It ended up capturing uh, a lot of media attention, and it eventually became the spark, as I say, that moved uh, the campaign around Section 43 out of the political domain into the legal one. Um, the father decided that uh, he would spank the uh, three-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, he tried to do that in the back seat of the car. She was squirming around a lot. So he put her on the trunk of the car. He pulled her pants down slightly and spanked her, I think, about five or six times. Um, that might have been the end of the occasion. She then uh, 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 proceeded to go into the restaurant uh, told her mother uh, that she had been misbehaving, but she was okay, and the birthday party proceeded, well, they thought they were going to proceed with the birthday party. Um, but a passenger, uh, uh, another patron of Olive Garden, uh, drove into the parking lot. She witnessed uh, the spanking going on, um, and she uh, exited her vehicle. She told uh, the father in no uncertain terms that she disapproves of physical discipline. Um, she noticed that he has Illinois plates, and she tells him, uh, in Canada, what you've just done is a crime, and I'm going to be calling the police. So she calls the police. Uh, they arrive. They arrest the father uh, for assault. He spends a night in jail. Um, he uh, uh, gets bail, uh, and the case proceeds, and it goes all the way to trial. Uh, the family come back for the trial. Eventually at trial, uh, the father is acquitted of assault and he's acquitted uh, using Section 43. And the court holds that he had been using uh, corrective uh, force and that it was excused under Section 43. Uh, the case attracted, uh, as I said, some media attention through various means. Um, and a professor at the University of Regina, Elsa Watkinson, uh, she penned an influential, she was... Um, Opposed to 43's, she penned um, an influential editorial criticizing the acquittal uh, in the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. And then she applied for court challenges uh, funding. Uh, she received that funding. Eventually, she paired up with the Canadian Foundation uh, for Children, uh, Youth, and the Law. Uh, and they proceeded uh, with the challenge, not directly on this case, obviously. This was, uh, uh, th they proceeded instead without um, an actual named child or a live case. Um, and it was the um, uh, Canadian Foundation that then uh, pursued the case um, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. So at the Supreme Court, um, the Canadian Foundation argued that Section 43 violates um, children's rights uh, to dignity, their equality rights. They said it manifests a legal regime that once treated uh, children as akin to chattel property uh, and not deserving uh, human beings deserving of their rights, right? So children were these kind of lag subjects who had not yet uh, been incorporated into the human rights regime as we know it. Um, but in addition to these rights claims and these claims around dignity, they also relied heavily on uh, social science evidence claims about the effects of physical discipline on children's behavior uh, and uh, development. Um, and uh, in particular, they relied um, quite heavily on um, developmental psychology um, and sociology literature. 
um, that attempts to reveal the effects of physical discipline uh, on children. Uh, and this evidence really provided an important basis for them um, to make the case that children need uh, protection from di physical discipline and they need it uh, through the criminal law and in particular what you notice with the developmental psychology literature is the idea that there is some sort of universalizable psyche uh, and there's a universalizable idea of discipline and that we can measure uh, both in a reliable fashion it's important to know just for anyone who uh, you know looks more carefully at social science they really can't get beyond correlation. Um, and that's in part because it would be um, unethical effectively to run controlled studies that would try to get at causation. But that also uh, raises a lot of questions because the populations tending to use more physical discipline uh, may also be populations that are under stress already in their home. And that will then also be correlated with uh, uh, behavior outcomes. And so there's a real problem within the methodology. And again, that wasn't uh, necessarily brought to light uh, for the court. But at, at the very least, what the advocates were putting forward was the claim that physical discipline is associated, correlated um, with poor behavioral outcomes, with increased aggression, sometimes with lower intelligence um, and reduced um, attention among uh, children. Um, they were relying on uh, various different professional organizations as well. Um, the, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has uh, recommended uh, against spanking. Um, also on um, Professor Strauss, who has been a pioneering American sociologist in the area of family violence. Um, and, and in particular, um, he has made the argument, um, sometimes to the, the making him a bit contentious uh, with some feminists, that corporal punishment really helps to explain high levels of violence in American society, uh, including spousal battering. Uh, so rather than seeing potentially battering as being uh, flowing necessarily from masculine domination, he really reads, um, uh, he theorizes that, um, that corporal punishment is at the root of it. Um, he once subbed up his argument um, pretty sim simply, which is, quote, if you want your child to grow up to be the kind of person who reasons instead of hits, I can't imagine why any parent would ever spank. Um, so he has a bit of an idealistic type, uh, arguably, vision, both of what happens when people uh, strike their children, but also the kind of forethought and foresight that might go into um, parents. Um, he has also attracted, and again, this didn't get any play uh, in this advocacy or before the court, but within uh, sociology itself in the US, he's attracted a lot of criticism uh, for ignoring or understating the role of class, uh, race, and community dynamics in thinking about physical discipline, uh, both among those who use it uh, and about how children may perceive it differently. And that's a really key point that I'm going to return to in a minute. Uh, but those kind of critiques didn't travel uh, with the reception of his evidence uh, into uh, and its presenting in front of the law, which I think is a bigger question that we have when we employ social science evidence in law. Uh, what happens when the critical literature around that method or approach uh, doesn't come before the court? Um, so uh, uh, these were the kinds of arguments, um, uh, as you can see from Professor Strauss. He ultimately likewise couldn't say that there was more than a correlation, but he wanted to go uh, as far as saying, and it's a bit nebulous, but kind of quote, uh, there's an accumulation of non-definitive evidence, which together leads me the, to the conclusion that it's causally related um, to harmful side effects. Um, that would obviously on a social science ground or science ground be a bit of a problematic statement because how would one determine causation from non-definitive evidence? I mean, causation requires a bit of definitive evidence. But that's an aside. Um, he was, was probably the strongest advocate for them to, to try to make uh, a causal argument. 
Um, so this, the social science evidence, um, which both uh, the, the challengers and the state to some extent relied upon, but then contested certain aspects of the evidence, um, it also proved really important, I think, for the Supreme Court of Canada um, in trying to retain uh, its institutional legitimacy as a court adjudicating these really this, this very contested question. Um, and it was really, I think, attempting to thread the needle between upholding uh, Section 43 amidst these outcries by children's rights advocates uh, and yet not uh, striking it down in the absence of any real Canadian consensus that all forms of physical or restraint or, or um, discipline are unreasonable and should be captured under our, our assault uh, provision. Um, and they were really, as I say, um, these contests over child rearing really strike at the heart of liberal democracies. Um, and Martha Minot has written about this in the context of how we think about women uh, versus children. Um, and I think this really helps to explain some of the deep challenges that the court faced uh, in this case and why you see them almost bending over backwards in these strange ways to save this provision, for instance, from vagueness uh, in a way that doctrinally is, is hard to explain on, on the terms. Um, so Martha Minot has written this about this these types of contests. She's written, quote, Honest consideration of the centrality of choice should make it clear that children, not women, lie at the heart of questions of cultural clash and accommodation. Indeed, children are the prime targets of socialization, and children, even in liberal societies, are not viewed as yet capable of choice. Any genuine effort to enable choice must focus on children. Yet any such effort then collides forcibly at the heart of culture, at the center of immigrant communities, at the core of third world societies, even at the most fundamental freedoms to reproduce and to raise children ensured by law to individuals in Western democratic societies. And I think these were the fundamental uh, core clashes about how uh, the court was attempting to find this middle ground um, between somehow respecting children as these new uh, rights-bearing citizens and yet knowing that we also allow parents uh, and require of parents tremendous latitude um, in how they actually raise their children. So what's important to note here, um, just for purposes of where the law is now and how we think about it, one is that for teachers, the court didn't need to look at social science evidence. So the court specifically says, in the case of teachers, we've reached a point of societal consensus. This was kind of chopping dead wood. All provincial uh, uh, education laws across the country had already updated to this. Um, teachers had long faced professional uh, disciplinary sanction if they were to try to use uh, corporal punishment in a public school. Um, so by the time of 2004, as I say, that's been socially resolved. That's dead wood. The court holds teachers can't use corporal punishment. They can only use restraint in cases where they kind of absolutely need to for compliance or where the child poses a threat uh, to themselves or others. But no such societal consensus by 2004, and I would argue even today, has been reached in Canada around parents. And that's where the court then relied in that absence of social consensus, uh, in part to kind of have institutional legitimacy. It helps them to be able to say, well, how will we resolve this? We'll look to the experts. And so when you get these kind of strange ways in which they solved 43, which was to say, um, as you can read here, um, corporal punishment will no longer be considered reasonable when it involves children under two because they can't uh, interpret correction. It won't be reasonable for teenagers because it uh, will foster uh, antisocial conduct. Uh, we won't allow you to use instruments. Uh, belts, uh, you know, chopsticks, rulers, whatever you're using. Uh, we won't allow you uh, to have blows to the head. All of those ways in which they both carved up bodily zones on the child, carved up types of force, whether it's the hand or the ruler, and carved up the chronology of the child that was all read in through uh, points of expertise that they said both the Crown and uh, uh, the appellants uh, shared. Right? And so you end up with, this, with this, this rendering of 43 that I think as Arbour convincingly uh, says in her dissent, uh, struck many as such a reach uh, 
uh, in terms of what we would have thought on doctrinal terms was facially vague. Uh, and yet when you can see what they were up against in real political terms, uh, this is, was the best way I think they, they sought to find uh, this middle ground. Um, one of the things, and now this is going to lead into the discussion um, about how we might have, how we might uh, think about some of these questions a bit differently, is that it's really fascinating uh, and and absolutely striking that throughout the party's arguments and throughout the court's reasons, um, children and parents are referred to in totally universal terms. So they don't have races. Uh, other than these ages for the teens or the under twos, uh, they don't have uh, uh, they don't have races. The, the, the caregivers don't have ages. Uh, there's no discussion of class. Uh, there's no discussion of indigenous families. Uh, essentially, these are deracinated parents and children. They're universalizable. Um, and that is really in total contradistinction to what we know about those who are involved in the child welfare system. Um, and so it's astonishing uh, that you would discuss um, uh, child welfare um, uh, investigations in Canada. And in particular, um, this is just a slide from a uh, child in incident study, which are the studies that come out each year, both federally and provincially, about incidents of child welfare involvement. As you can see by this study themselves, uh, people working in child welfare very much see police investigations and child welfare as potentially working uh, at least on parallel tracks, right? So they see this in part, uh, and this was one of the arguments about, you know, how, how do these two systems work together? It's striking then that in a discussion of police investigations there, that you would discuss that uh, without any attention to the populations that we know uh, uh, are heavily surveilled and heavily involved uh, in uh, child uh, welfare. Um, and one of the things is that in uh, deflecting away from these markers of difference, um, I think both the parties in the court uh, really deflected away from some of the distributive questions uh, about the political economy of child rearing that have always been at the heart of how the Canadian state uh, has regulated parenting, certainly since the late 19th century when the modern child wel welfare regimes, uh, as we know, uh, arose. And it's worth recalling in that respect um, that child welfare regimes in particular um, have always disparately impacted uh, poorer families um, in a way that those families have not experienced necessarily as supportive, but definitely uh, as punitive. Um, and it's easier to see the class politics in some of the earlier instantiations of child welfare. So um, John Joseph Kelso, uh, who founded Canada's first humane society, like in the US, the first humane society involved uh, animals and children, um, but eventually uh, the two break away. Um, he lobbied in 1887 for uh, the first kind of general uh, child welfare law in Canada here in Ontario, the Protection and Reformation of Neglected Children Act. Um, and he wrote in 1894, quote, in this latter part of the 19th century, more attention is being paid to the causes and sources of crime than ever before. Every day it is becoming more evident that in the past, much effort has been wasted in dealing with effects rather than causes. And the most advantaged thinkers now acknowledge that to effectively grapple with crime and vice, thought and effort must be concentrated on the children and the poor. Um, and so what progressive children savers that, that gave birth to the modern child welfare regime as we know it, um, and including um, uh, some of the now attempts to, to bring the criminal line more in, to bring the criminal law more in line with child welfare, um, they certainly identified the children of the poor uh, at the outset um, as uh, potential future blights on society, um, those most likely to become criminals uh, and vagabonds. Obviously, since then, you know, when we fast forward to Canadian Foundation, to contemporary discussions, we've certainly, uh, we would no longer talk explicitly uh, in search, such terms. Um, but the operation of child welfare regimes, in fact, 
um, continue to cut deeply across class lines and obviously across, as I'll show in a second, across lines of indigenous and non-indigenous uh, children as indigenous children, certainly from the 60s onward, became far more incorporated into a system that at one time uh, had not looked at them at all. Um, and that fact, that social structure that informs both who is policed, how, what the effects are on them from either child welfare or presumably uh, uh, if 43 is totally repealed, even, even the 43 as it's been narrowed down, uh, those structural points or those populations appear nowhere. Uh, on either side of the Crown arguments, the, the Canadian Foundation, none of the interveners or the court itself. And that in itself is, is astonishing and, and shows that there's a politics of neutrality really at work um, uh, uh, in uh, some of this advocacy that I think we really need uh, to pay attention to. Um, since uh, Canadian Foundation has been decided, um, we obviously know also that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, has been attempting to address uh, in a structural way the legacy of residential schools in Canada. Um, the TRC has most recently added its voice to calls uh, to repeal Section 43. And what's really significant that I want you to notice is that the TRC places its call for repeal under its heading on education. Um, it actually doesn't see it and doesn't see, uh, in my view, some of the obvious uh, real problems uh, and potentially aggravating crises that repeal of Section 43 could have for the catastrophe uh, that many uh, uh, First Nations families and communities are feeling right now vis-a-vis -vis child welfare. Um, and what's interesting is that um, uh, the TRC uh, saw repeal of 43 as a way to respond um, to the educational legacy of residential schools, uh, which as we know were replete uh, with corporal punishment and with egregious and extreme levels of physical abuse. Um, but as the Canadian Foundation case established already prior to this by the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, that is no longer within the ambit of Section 43. Uh, teachers can no longer use corporal punishment in schools. They would face criminal charges like uh, anyone else. Um, instead, really, the central question for 43 and its real work, uh, outside of the narrow restraint uh, exception, the real work now is around parents. Um, and so uh, rather than addressing school abuse, uh, it's, it's uh, really interesting to see how much repeal 43 has become the common sense position among those who see themselves as progressive on children's rights, such that even the TRC um, uh, didn't seem not to see or to catch that repealing Section 43 risks further encroachment of the punitive state uh, into the homes of Indigenous families, uh, who, as they note, as you can see in uh, their call on child welfare number one, and that extends at length, uh, are already hyper uh, surveilled and face um, as I said, really catastrophically high rates of child removal uh, uh, from their homes as compared to non-Indigenous um, uh, Canadians. And joining uh, child welfare interventions with potential criminal intervention rather than pushing on a public support uh, uh, project uh, really, in my view, continues rather than ameliorates uh, the practice of policing Indigenous parents that was at the heart of residential schooling, right? The, the, the child had to be was taken and removed out of the parental home uh, into the school. And yet, uh, the, I think the way in which the, the repeal position has become so dominant and so common sense, uh, it, it didn't even seem to give, uh, uh, a, it didn't even seem to give pause to the those who are enmeshed in some of uh, the crises of child welfare um, today. Certainly the political wins likewise uh, because of the TRC's recommendation are in part uh, uh, behind the repeal campaign. Um, I'll get to at the end of the talk exactly where we sit with repeal at the moment. There's a bill uh, in front of the Senate, but the Liberals, as we know, uh, in, in, in part um, to give uh, effect to the TRC's recommendations, have suggested that they would be uh, supportive of repeal uh, 
uh, at some point. So um, what I want to move to for the remainder of my time um, is to consider um, the ways in which, as I said at my opening, the ways in which uh, each step in a process of trying to use social science evidence to properly guide uh, law and policy reform, in fact, involves really important ethical choices. Um, and, and this isn't to say at all, this isn't to question that one should rely on and be mobilizing social science evidence, but it is to really force us, I think, to ask more carefully and to admit more fulsomely as advocates the types of choices we're making in terms of the questions we ask, the methodologies re we rely upon, and the type of legal uh, options that those methods then give rise to. Um, and I'm not, it, it, it isn't clear to me at all that uh, advocates in this area have necessarily been kind of owning up or taking responsibility uh, for the lines of research they're pursuing and, and not pursuing. Um, so this is just some quotes from uh, a legal scholar. He's um, at Columbia now, uh, Bernard Harcourt, uh, who works, um, uh, I mean, in an astonishing array uh, of areas. Um, uh, but this is something that he wrote. So he pursued this, this study, as you can see, Language of the Gun, in which he actually pursued his own qualitative study, uh, going out to a youth detention facility and interviewing about 80 young offenders who had had gun possession uh, uh, charges, uh, convictions and talking to them about how they understood the meaning of guns. Um, and he said that when you actually uh, conduct that type of qualitative uh, research, as opposed to just maybe quantitative research about levels of injury, levels of shootings, uh, which might lend you toward a more law and order approach, he said shifting your mode of social science engagement may lead both to different questions and then to potentially different approaches, right? Uh, and he found that, that young people associated uh, having guns with all sorts of uh, uh, different meanings uh, for them that sheds different light. And as you can see from the slide, um, he's just making um, clear that when we use certain social science methods and approaches, um, we have some built-in assumptions um, about both um, uh, how the way that we conceive of the world will shape men and women, um, uh, how we will shape uh, the society uh, that, uh, that we uh, are, are choosing uh, to try to design for, and that you're making eth ethical choices at each point that will have important distributional consequences uh, when those lines of research are attempted to be drawn into uh, law reform. Um, and what I want to suggest is that when, um, in the area of uh, 43 advocacy, when opponents um, have relied on developmental psychology and on sociology that has been unmoored uh, from any considerations of race, gender, um, indigeneity, or class, um, they're presenting, as I said, these universal parents um, and these universal children in a way that kind of individualizes acts of physical uh, discipline that can then be rightfully uh, punished as criminal wrongdoing. Instead, they're not seeing uh, acts of, of parenting or physical discipline or restraint um, as social forms of reproduction that are deeply informed um, by one's economic standing, by community norms, um, and by your daily living conditions. And likewise, uh, in terms of the child uh, who may be experiencing this, um, there's also a built-in assumption when you just look to developmental psychology that has no markers of contextualizing the child um, that, that children are universal and that they necessarily experience and process physical discipline and restraint as harmful and that potentially criminally, criminally trying their parents uh, will be worth it in the end uh, if you can reform uh, these uh, practices. But in fact, uh, if we chose to ask other questions like, do children uh, necessarily universally interpret physical discipline in the same ways, which isn't a question that advocates have been asking, uh, there's a lot of research that suggests they don't. Um, so um, uh, uh, social science in the United States has shown uh, that children may interpret and respond to physical discipline differently according to dominant norms about corporal punishment in their, quote, community. And that can be defined sometimes in regional, class, uh, religious, or ethnic terms. Um, these studies also um, 
uh, uh, suggest uh, that uh, someone like Strauss, uh, who the Canadian Foundation relied on heavily, um, have failed to take into account these markers of class, gender, uh, race, that may uh, very much impact how children process this, uh, th th this kind of discipline. Um, in one of the first longitudinal studies uh, to examine uh, correlates of young adolescents' attitudes about physical discipline, um, American researchers found in 2003 that African American and lower income youths were more approving of parental corporal punishment than their European American and higher income peers. Um, and so in other words, there seems to be at the very least uh, a body of critical and contextual research that one would want to consider that suggests that that child discipline does not have uh, a fixed meaning that can be universally inscribed on a neutral psyche. Um, but those, again, these figures of um, uh, these more complex accounts, these more textures account, have really just not figured in the expert theories of harm that opponents of 43 have put forward um, in Canada. Um, another thing that we might um, want to ask about if we were to actually uh, take up Harcourt's suggestion and, and, and kind of ask different questions um, and methods would be to say, uh, what about the ways in which child maltreatment uh, writ large, uh, if we were to start you know, treating all forms of physical discipline presumably as within this, um, how, how is this surveillance and the incident rate unevenly distributed across Canadian society? Um, and what types of policy implications, if any, should that have? So re researchers have shown, and I'll show on your next slide, um, that parents with fewer resources, so either they lack employment, they have lower income, lower educational attainment, um, have a greater likelihood in contemporary society of using corporal punishment, um, parental stress, is highly associated um, with the risk of violence, particularly when parents approve of corporal punishment. And this is why, as I referred to earlier around the correlations, um, some researchers say then that what you're seeing when you see a correlation between corporal punishment and poor developmental incomes is that family stress may be driving both. Uh, and maybe the causal explanator rather than one uh, or the other. Um, but one of the factors we might want to ask, which again, there is no discussion of gender or the gendered impacts of 43 repeal, is um, what are we to make of the fact that, as you can see, 86% uh, of uh, cases of substantiated child maltreatment in Canada involve uh, a mother uh, as the biological mother as the primary caregiver. Right. Uh, so many feminists said 43 is akin to the excuses we might used to make for spousal abuse and that it's a way that it that it continues to excuse male violence in the home against women and children. Um, but what in fact, if it ends up that in fact, uh, single mother homes that are under acute levels of economic stress are going to be the ones, like they are in maltreatment, uh, most heavily uh, policed and, and lacking in the supports uh, that they need. Um, what about uh, the ways in which um, families make income who are likewise uh, most, most found to have substantiated uh, uh, cases of maltreatment. You can see just about 51% have full-time income, but notice the rate 33, a full 33% are relying for their primary source of income on social assistance. Uh, another 10 are on part-time or arguably um, precarious uh, labor, right? Uh, these are families arguably uh, in economic need. Uh, bringing in further criminal prosecution is not necessarily going to, and as I'm going to say in a second, I think is going to aggravate uh, the economic plight of, of these families and of the children uh, that we are all you know, probably on the same page at in terms of wanting to actually uh, reach. Um, and finally, these are some really staggering numbers for any of you who follow um, indig uh, Indigenous uh, families in Canada. You will know uh, that they regularly, Cindy Blackstock obviously, and others, the TRC, have been very outspoken about what they see as a crisis. Uh, these are the rates of um, 
uh, of children who are in foster care. So these are children who are removed from the home uh, through a child welfare intervention. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but Indigenous children uh, in response to child welfare visits also face uh, far higher instances of earlier removal from the home uh, than non-Indigenous children. Uh, and so you can see the rates, uh, the disparities are, are, are pretty staggering, right? And this is why uh, this is increasingly uh, for many uh, Indigenous, along with the over-incarceration of Indigenous people, is probably one of their top two crises priority areas, right? Uh, adding uh, an RCMP officer coming on reserve or, or getting involved uh, in this to me, uh, uh, it, again, I, th I think it just shows how powerful the, the get rid of 43 move has become, that it's, it, it has become a bit unmoored from what I think would be uh, the, uh, the contextual reality uh, for families. Um, the other thing that, and then I, I'm going to close. Um, uh, am I OK, though, for, for time? But uh, just a couple more minutes. Um, uh, is uh, what will be the consequences? Uh, already we have, so I've uh, done uh, a study of all the 43, uh, all the cases post Canadian Foundation. These are just the reported cases though, obviously. Uh, so we're looking at a tiny sample size compared to any that might involve pleas or drop charges. Um, uh, but what uh, will be the potential effects already of a more narrowed 43, but certainly if 43 were dropped altogether? Right. Um, and advocates of repeal in conceptualizing the criminal law have really tended, and you see this in their factums, um, have tended to emphasize the expressive or communicative function of criminal law. Right. That repeal will signal uh, to parents that physical discipline is no longer acceptable in Canada and they'll amend their child rearing practices accordingly. Right. And so that's a you know, it's it's a faithful aspiration to have in the law, but there's little. And, and then they kind of suggest and pr good police and prosecutors will weed out cases that we would just see as as totally uh, unreasonable. I have actually found, though, uh, at least a few uh, people who have proceeded to trial on timeouts. Uh, people said, oh, there's absolutely no way you would ever go to trial on a timeout. Well, I can tell you how you can end up in trial in a timeout. And what you see is the majority of post-Canadian Foundation Section 43 cases, the parents are separated or in the context of undergoing a separation. And you can also obviously understand in a case of a high conflict situation, you get one parent pushing for the other parent to potentially be charged, including for placing rough, uh, using rough uh, handling of a child into a timeout. It proceeded to trial. There was an acquittal under 43. But arguably, if that proceeded post 43, that, that, that would count as a conviction, arguably, particularly when you have the other parent uh, pushing for it. So there's little acknowledgement in any case, uh, I think, or at least a reckoning with uh, how the systems of policing and prosecution also enact the family law. It doesn't, criminal law obviously does not simply send messages from the books. It is also exercised and enacted in real life, and it is enacted in disparate ways, particularly in the family context. Uh, those families who are most at risk because they're already subject to surveillance or maybe subject to more surveillance because they have more interactions with the public system, uh, they may have more precarious housing. They're in public view more. Uh, they're also the least, so they are the most at risk of attracting criminal law scrutiny. They're also the least able to bear its costs, including the collateral costs that will flow even if you don't get convicted. Um, so immigrant, working class, poor, single parent, and especially indigenous families, uh, if they have to take out time, uh, this is the, the CBA report on collateral consequences that came out last summer. Um, uh, so these are all kinds of consequences that we don't, that flow from uh, convictions, but also flow sometimes from any interactions with police. Uh, they have to take time out for court dates, maybe plea negotiations, uh, maybe meeting with child welfare officials. That can obviously compromise their employment. It can also compromise uh, their uh, adequate care for children. Uh, even even if they're not convicted of uh, an offense, as I said, a variety of non-conviction records um, can be still established. There's no single uh, statutory definition of a criminal record check in Canada. 
Um, and so police practices on that also differ in terms of the level of non-conviction information that are disclosed. And often you're going to be consenting to that uh, through an employment check. And so because you give consent, uh, the, the bundle of information that is going to be released can differ according to different uh, police forces. Um, some will be releasing acquittals, withdrawn charges, um, even suspect information can sometimes be released. Um, and like I say, if that is going to affect your employment, you may be waiving your privacy rights uh, for that uh, to be released. So the last thing I want to just close with is to think, if we were to think uh, of child rearing in more political economy terms, um, how would our approach here potentially differ pretty radically from the one that is being put forward uh, uh, as a welfare uh, pursuit? Um, I think uh, we would have to, uh, as I say, if we looked more at how discipline is unevenly distributed, um, and if we looked how the criminal law may have different consequences for different families, including which families it will reach, um, we may end up having very different law and policy options, right? Um, so on the left is a more, and, and I just want to loop back to Blackstone here to finish, on the left is very much more the Blackstonian image that that child that children's rights people ironically are very much continuing, which is that child rearing is primarily a private responsibility. The state steps in to police bad child rearing at its extremes through child welfare, perhaps through an expanded criminal law approach. Um, but in exchange for that, uh, we'll give you a lot of latitude in terms of the choices that you want to make around child rearing so long as you keep within those levels of kind of producing a socially acceptable functioning person who can eventually enter into the political and economic world that we live in. Uh, if, if, however, we were to conceive of child rearing it as a more public good, as something that is an, an essential part of social reproduction of every society, then uh, we might think about how we would be trying to uh, support child rearing uh, and support the labor that goes into that, right? So we know ways that clearly, uh, uh, we know from, from evidence very clear ways that you can reduce child maltreatment uh, uh, and stress at home. Uh, early home supportive interventions, particularly for younger parents who may not have the skills or support, uh, can, can prove very effective. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has now ordered our federal government a, a, a three times uh, that it is in violation for inequitable funding of child welfare services for children living on reserve. We have yet to rectify that. Most recently, the Committee on the Elimination uh, of Racial Discrimination uh, made comment on Canada's failure to equalize funding. Um, you know, it's very easy to change Section 43 on the books and just erase it and roll out a little more policing. Uh, it would arguably have a much better effect if Indigenous families uh, were supported uh, in the same way other Canadians. Likewise, the levels of social assistance, if, if almost 35% of your child maltreatment uh, uh, families are on social assistance, uh, the, the lower the level, the more family stress there'll be. Uh, obviously, universal daycare has been something that's been on many of our radars for a long time yet to be realized. Uh, and maybe I think that the, the counterbalance for that would be maybe that there would be then, uh, uh, as Pam and I were saying earlier, to quote the great Milton Friedman, uh, there's no free lunch, right? And maybe if uh, you were getting more uh, uh, positive uh, uh, support if the state was, was ponying up for more in the area. Uh, maybe it's possible that parents would have less latitude on something else. That's something we could think about. Um, uh, but I think that could be, you know, parents with more resources might actually uh, see, see certain functions scaled back in the same way maybe we do in universal health care. Um, uh, so I'm going to leave it uh, there. I've gone on a long time. Um, but I hope it's been interesting. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to discussing hearing from you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. I think it's going to be helpful for the purposes of the recording if we can more or less speak in the direction of these microphones. Um, and uh, so I'll be in charge of, of the queue. Do we have anybody who wants to jump in? Sure. Go ahead. 
No, I'll oh, take you, and then why? Well, you were the first hand I saw, and then we'll take Professor. Uh, my one question is with respect to the private member's bill that's currently sort of stuck right. not even getting the second reading. Good and, that you brought that up, yeah. And I was just wondering if you could sort of expand sort of where that's at, the discussion regards that. I found it particularly interesting when you were talking about the PRC recommendation. Yeah. And if you look at the answer, the debates right now, it's the, the, the reasoning behind repeal right now is one of two things, which is how are parents supposed to understand the Supreme yeah. Court judgment one, and two, the PRC recommends it, ergo it should be repealed. Yeah. And that seems to be the, the push right now, at least in, in the political realm at the Senate. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of where that's, where that's at. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for raising that. Um, so currently, uh, there's a private member's bill that has uh, passed second reading, and it's been there since July. Uh, and has not moved since. It was introduced by Senator Celine Hervieux Payet and is now being forwarded uh, by Senator Sinclair. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, so that's where it is right now. There hasn't been, I'm kind of checking in periodically uh, to see when, when and if that moves. It's, it's uh, uh, the essence of the bill for those who aren't familiar, uh, and there have been bills like this before. Uh, the essence of the bill is that it would fully repeal Section 43 and it would have a year, um, a year in term uh, for the government to roll out uh, further public education campaigns to tell parents that within a year uh, any uh, physical discipline will constitute a crime. So that's kind of the, the essence of it. Um, and I agree. So I'll just say two things. I mean, first on the TRC account, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it's the issue of corporal punishment now. What's happened is that the issue of corporal punishment as a social problem, and in particular, the extreme physical abuse that children suffered in residential schools has now become for many uh, this kind of automatic link. That's a problem and the solution is repeal. And it's become this reflex position now. Uh, and I'm very surprised that that became such a reflex that nobody's saying this because the more that I say this I think that it's so obvious and that I'm obviously right. But, but that's... Um, <laughs> Um, because I have a robust self-esteem, but, uh, but no, seriously, um, I I'm surprised, but uh, it just shows, I think, to me, the power that this campaign has had. It's a very, uh, I think, simply, it's, it's, it's well argued and it's very straightforward. Uh, and, and, um, and so, I mean, one of the things, just to say briefly about residential schools, is that 43 certainly never had anything to do with the, the, the rates of violence in residential schools. Residential schools were coming to, were, were rising at the very same time that non-Indigenous public schools were starting to increasingly clamp down on corporal punishment. They were starting to introduce corporal punishment notebooks, you know, an administrative tack to where you had to, you had to leave the classroom, go to the principal. There were all these ways through the late 19th, certainly well into the 20th century, when they're administratively starting to close down on it. By the 60s, the Toronto School Board leads the way, but you're getting then school boards across the country and then education acts that are restricting it. Uh, uh, residential schools, on the other hand, were being given at the exact same time essentially an, an administrative carte blanche. They were being given substandard teachers with little or no oversight. The first statement, administrative statement on corporal punishment that I have found for residential, residential schools comes in 1953. The first ever written statement that I can find, and that according even to the TRC suggests, and I didn't find anything earlier, that sets out any type of policy, right? So it was purposely a hands-off policy because it was purposely meant to wreak havoc and disrupt and break uh, their lives. There were certainly never any trials going to go on for these teachers. There were go trials going on for regular public school teachers if parents got exercised enough and had the resources. That simply was going on. It was a completely different conceptual administrative uh, regime because it was based on a logic of separating the child from their family and then subjecting them to completely substandard schooling and everything else. So even the way in which 43 ever or didn't have a presence then doesn't match up. And certainly the current state of the law today 
I think will only cut against the interests, in my view, potentially of indigenous families. The only last thing I'll add on that point is that some people have said to me, but with so many uh, indigenous children in institutional care, in foster homes, et cetera, would you not want 43 expand, uh, eliminated so that foster parents who use corporal punishment against children in their care could be tried? But the thing is that many, um, I mean, the foster child parent relationship is already very statutorily regulated in theory. Of course, in practice, there are immense failures, which is why the system is problematic to begin with. But in theory, I mean, across the provinces already, they say that foster parents are not supposed to use physical discipline on children. And if they do, they can automatically remove the child. Uh, so there are just a ways in which there's a mismatch, but it's become, I think, more of a mantra to deal with what obviously has been and continues to be a real problem, which is physical maltreatment of children. Um, but I think the solution doesn't mix. And, and, and on the point about mixed messaging for parents, I think there is some mixed messaging. I think the criminal code, like lots of provisions, should be rewritten. And what they could do is rewrite the provision uh, to comport with the wording from a Canadian foundation, even if I find some of the things they did in Can Canadian Foundation problematic, that it is what it is, uh, that's our law now, and you could revise the provision to provide that clarity. Uh, and that would be also a pretty easy fix. Thanks very much. Um, there's lots here to think about, and I have a whole bunch of thoughts um, Great. around in my head, so let's see if I can make them kind of cohere. Yeah, thank so, you. I guess one of the things I was interested in um, is perhaps we just say a little bit more about the relationship between child welfare and policing. Yeah. I, and I guess because, at least as I understand some of the child welfare research, yeah. um, and we often use the term maltreatment, which means many, many things. Yeah. Uh, but the vast majority of kids who come into care, and in particular Indigenous children, African Canadian children, other racialized children, yeah. um, they're being brought into care not because of the exercise of physical yeah. um, um, assault or force or sexual abuse against the children, but rather it's viewed in the drama. Yes, yes. And, and often that has to do with poverty yeah. uh, and the, the, um, in the inability to provide adequate yeah. uh, shelter and food, et cetera, and sometimes with other what are called caregiver risk factors. Yes. Uh, that might be things that are already heavily surveilled by police, including exposure to domestic violence yes. or drug use. Yes. But because so much of it is connected to um, to poverty. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's some research that suggests, you know, that if you control for a variety of factors, you can see that that, that race isn't the predominant thing yes. people are coming into care. It's poverty. Mm -hmm. so, um, so then I, I'm just wondering a little bit about how the argumentation then plays out around um, the interplay between child welfare and, uh, and the criminal justice system in light of those kinds of reasons that kids come into care. And I guess connected to that, um, also, you know, in, in uh, your point is, I think, a really important one about the ways in which um, children and parenting experiences of discipline are all universalized, mm. is, you know, what happens if we push further uh, the different um, cultural practices yeah. around child rearing, because clearly yeah. that's been something that's been raised by Indigenous communities for a very, very long time, right? Yeah. And it's not so much the exercise of discipline, but what many white social workers saw as the absence of discipline, yeah. which, which was bringing kids into care. So, you know, what happens if we push that a little bit further? Yeah. And then the last thing that um, I guess I'm kind of perplexed about yeah. is uh, your final slide. I agree. You know, the, the approach on the right would be a, a much more satisfactory approach. Mm. And the criminal justice system wrecks havoc for all kinds of reasons, as you pointed out. Mm. And in some ways, then, the, the retention of um, Section 43 is a way to try to keep the, oddly enough, the criminal justice system yeah. at bay. Yeah. But I was thinking, oh, how would you would react if um, I, uh, someone proposed adding a provision to the criminal code um, around domestic violence, yeah. for example, which again, to try to keep the criminal justice system at bay, the use of reasonable force. Yeah. And the way you used to approach it would yeah. be fine, and that yeah. keeps the criminal justice system out the vast majority of the time. Yeah. And, and of course, I would be very unhappy with that, even though I think the criminal justice system does a terrible job yeah. in responding to domestic violence. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess that just kind of leaves me troubled with you know where I would want to go with Section yeah. three. Yeah. I can see all yeah. the reasons to keep the criminal justice system out, and as I say, that kind of helps, but yeah. in an odd way, that feels very yeah. uncomfortable.
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks uh, so much for these. Um, so on the first, uh, I'm going to take the questions in reverse order. So on the criminal code and domestic violence, um, so I also share some of your concerns, as do many other uh, uh, feminists, and in particular, uh, you know, feminists of color in the U.S. and Canada uh, have been very vocal about what some of the unintended consequences of no-drop policies have been uh, in the domestic violence context. What happens when when women simply want uh, instances of force to be stopped, but do not necessarily want their partner. Uh, to be brought through the full criminal justice system, and they then, uh, in many cases, lose control uh, uh, and have no control over the process once they've engaged it. Um, so I share that uh, a lot of concerns uh, about that. Um, uh, so that would be just as a first point. Um, I still, and so then the question becomes, well, would I potentially want a 43, you know, would this potentially say, should we go back? And um, I, I, you know, I, I too would also be profoundly uneasy with, uh, with a, a provision that said you can use reasonable force uh, to correct your spouse. Um, and one of the reasons, although that of the two are not mutually exclusive to suggest because I don't want that, therefore that no draw, I think there are lots of things that we could try and we are doing more of uh, around trying to revisit what it would mean for women's voices to be taken more seriously in the process of a domestic violence uh, uh, call, charge, prosecution, right? I think we're revisiting the idea that simply, well, maybe they're too victimized that they can't even choose. So, so I think those are separate. Why, why do I think that 43, though, isn't the same? Um, I think because this, the parent, child, and the spousal relationship I do not think are analogous. And children's rights advocates in the Canadian Foundation case in their campaigning have very much argued that they are, right? And some feminists uh, across this country have agreed very much that this is akin to the same way that we used to privatize and allow wife battering, that this is just a holdover of that. Um, I see the, the spousal and the parent-child relationship both legally, socially, and, and materially uh, very differently. Um, there are ways in which, now, if, if the alternative were that we're going to take a truly child liberationist approach, we're going to have a revolution and we're not going to require children to legally go to school, to legally be present at places they're going to be consenting to and choosing and making all the same kinds of choices as wives now do or women or anyone else in domestic partnership, that would be different. But nobody's putting that on the table. So even the children's rights advocates agree that you can maybe put a child in a timeout or put them in a seeing the world as other people see it out. Or, you know, there's new phrases that, that Palma Sit told me. Sit and watch. Sit and watch, <laughs> sorry. Sit and watch. Uh, uh, that you, you, nobody really would, would reasonably say, and why? Why do we say you can put the child and sit and watch? Because there is still uh, a social expectation that the, that the, that the parent will, will, as you said around this question, what if they don't discipline enough? Uh, they can also get police for not disciplining not enough. And there is an expectation that you will socialize your, ch your children in at least a way to be socially functional. And if you don't, you can face you can face consequences. You could face intervention. You can sometimes face liability for things that your children do. Um, and we wouldn't say it's okay to correct your spouse and put him or her in a timeout or to remove privileges. Uh, if you, you know, uh, uh, get in a fight with your spouse, is it pre would, would, what would we say if you came to work the next day and said, well, I don't have my cell phone because I raised my voice last night. My spouse took away my cell phone for a week. People would be raising real questions that you're in an emotionally abusive relationship. But a parenting advocate suggests that instead of using physical discipline, one of the te techniques that you use is to remove privileges. Um, and you do that because you can you own that property you gave them that cell phone so I think that I, I think that I think it's a little bit actually like I, I think the analogy when you press it a bit more just doesn't match with what we expect legally and socially of parents and how we construct childhood is that is that helpful yeah no that's very helpful but it still doesn't give me a reason to keep section 43 right and no it doesn't 
Not right. It just, just force. yeah, okay, got you. But at least it says why I do not see them necessarily as the same, right? And then the final reason, and this will link to do, so why do I still think 43 could, why do I think it's still permissible to keep the criminal law out, including around the things like poverty? Because I think given that we uh, put these responsibilities on parents, like for instance, you can be criminally responsible if you don't provide you know, the necessities of life to your child. Uh, you, you, know, you will face all kinds of criminal surveillance if, if you don't provide in the way that impoverished families do when they face neglect proceedings. Um, I think it's, um, I, I think parents both, and those vulnerable parents both bear all those responsibilities and then if in the course of their child rearing, for which we don't even have a full social consensus, they are surveilled and used even, which now only is permitted very trivial uh, amounts of force, they then have the criminal state potentially intervening in a way that will then deprive them of their income, uh, if they have income, uh, subject them to maybe more precarious housing, uh, a lesser ability to get welfare, and that will all impinge on their ongoing responsibilities in law to their child. Uh, you don't even have that level of responsibility to your spouse. Uh, it may be really socially bad for you if you're relying on your spouse, but, but there's a whole legal machinery of ways that we impose these costs on them that I think the criminal law directly undermines their ability to do that, and we're talking about now pretty limited levels of force. Yeah, so a couple things. I should say first that I'm very sympathetic to your argument, and uh, it's given me, I've always had an intuition that just repealing Section 43 doesn't seem right to me, but that this, uh, this gives me a lot more uh, sort of maybe reasons to think that my intuition might have some grounding. But one concern that I have um, is that, as you know, Justice Arbour, yeah. uh, in her dissenting judgment, her, one of the main criticisms she leveled against Section 43 before the spanking case yeah. was that there were all these atrocious examples yeah. in the case law of yeah. a really abusive behavior being yeah. recognized as being reasonable uses of force. Yeah. And I am not as familiar as you yeah. are with the post-Section 43 cases, but I remember head-noting a case a few years ago of a man who used, quote-unquote, forceful spanking against his small yeah. child and left a big black handprint yeah. bruise on her bottom and was that was found to be reasonable force. Yeah. And uh, so I, I worry about the kind of the structure of the, the apparent vagueness of the even after yeah. what the Supreme Court has done with it and, and whether it is providing a shelter for for some behavior that really is abusive, while at the same time recognizing the validity of what you have to say. So I, that was my first observation. Sure. And my second observation, totally unrelated, is just that I guess what's always struck me as problematic about just repealing Section 43 is that, and, and I'm not a person who has you know some of those markers of marginalization that you've been talking about that are associated with people who are likely to be surveilled, but I do have a child who has severe autism yeah. And in my personal experience, raising a child with special needs is a highly physical yeah. thing. There's like, yeah. I'm just physically involved with him all the time. You know? yeah. So to sort of, even yeah. just as a kind of presumptive thing to say that when I'm physically controlling him, that that's yeah. somehow abusive unless it, it just doesn't seem like the right way to yeah. slice that apple, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I don't know, I'm just, that's my, my sense is that maybe that's just another kind of specific context where parenting is more complicated than just the child has the autonomy to say no. Yeah. It's a lot more active and yeah. interactive than that. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, excellent, thanks. Um, so uh, first on the, the, the question about uh, how was Section 43 interpreted before Canadian Foundation, uh, what does it look like now? I absolutely agree with you, um, and, and particularly as as you move back earlier and earlier, which I've tried to look at not in not in the same depth as post Canadian Foundation in terms of looking at all of it, but uh, but certainly the main case law in the 20th century on 43, you find as you would say uh, cases that we would find very egregious that uh, that were uh, excused under 43 and and. Um, uh, various of the interveners 
uh, really put all those cases in front of the court, and that was a big issue that they faced. And a lot of it, you know, sometimes was through anecdotal reasoning of judges. Well, I had this happen to me. I was paddled. I was hit with a belt, and I've turned out okay. Uh, therefore, you know, we're not going to find uh, that this is categorically unreasonable. Um, and they were really all over the place. Um, so my, uh, uh, and I've read your head note of, of the, the one, um, the case you're referencing with the rough spanking. Um, my sense is certainly that that case would be on the margins of what I have seen uh, uh, survive uh, and reach a Section 43 acquittal post-Canadian Foundation. So judges have really been, uh, and these are again, like just the ones I'm seeing at trial, so presumably there's a lot that, there's some um, that's getting pled out earlier where they just know they're not going to reach, they're not going to uh, convince. But judges, for the most part, have been very rigorous in applying uh, the categories and the checks uh, that the court uh, laid out. Um, I've seen convictions, you know, somebody has a 13 year old and she's, they're concerned because she's doing drugs again and again with the boyfriend. They go, they kind of roughly uh, grab her, bring her home and they say either you're getting a, a grounding or we're going to spank you or something like this. She chooses the spanking rather than the grounding because she wants to go out with the boyfriend again. They do it. Uh, the court says, wait a second, she's a teenager. Canadian Foundation made clear no corrective force for teenagers and children cannot consent. They don't get to choose to opt out of the law. Uh, and so you're reading in a conviction. I have not seen, I would say the case that you had noted, I can't recall it right now, uh, is definitely on the outer boundaries of what I've seen. I think there has been a clear shift. You do not see any of this using electric cables and getting out of 43, nothing. That's all out, obviously, for objects. You see courts saying you struck in the face, that's categorically read off. Uh, you are seeing much more close to the line cases that go either way. So that would be my answer on the first. I think there has been a profound shift. And I think it was one of the problems with 43 before. And whether, wh however you think about the Supreme Court decision, I think it, it nipped a lot. It closed down a lot of that. And I bet a lot of that, some of that's getting pled out earlier would be my intuition. Some of the more extreme stuff. On the physical involvement, I mean, I think this again uh, comes back to my point earlier uh, 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 to Janet's question, which is, um, you know, it, it is how much is child rearing actually different? Um, how is the physicality of child rearing work different? Uh, if we don't live in a truly child liberationist uh, society, and if your child uh, can't uh, uh, function because uh, of um, uh, any way in a liberationist utopia, because they have uh, care needs, uh, including physical care needs, um, uh, I think in some respects, uh, we have to take that seriously. Um, and I, you know, I certainly think, you know, uh, it, it, again, no advocate is going to sit and say, well, if you have uh, special needs or a more high needs a child for any sort of reason, that, you know, if you're having to handle them more, restrain them more, that you're going to get policed. But I mean, at least on its very face, some of the levels of restraint that people use with their child all the time, certainly, as I say, technically, you couldn't use with your spouse. Um, and I do think that there needs to be sometimes a more fulsome discussion uh, about that in a way that doesn't simply make people feel, well, if I admit to any of that, I'll appear to be someone who, you know, that we're all on an extreme between that and using electrical cables. Right, um, and I think there's a materiality. I, I remember once being at a childhood studies conference, and this line always stuck in my head, where someone said, "You know, childhood studies in the humanities is really focusing on social constructions of childhood, how childhood has undergone such a transformation in the last century, when children used to work, and now they." Do. And, and they said, "But you know, so lots of it's socially constructed, but children still lose their teeth." And I remember I just kind of went, huh, yeah, they do. I mean, there are material things about child development, about the body that are real and that are material and that are physical. And, um, and I think that's at least worth and important to keep in mind and not to simply abstract to the level of a human rights dignity bearing subject who has no corporeal form and for whom 
you know, you almost have on this legal plane above it. So I, I take that point and really share it. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a, a, a question or, or a provocation or just a, a plea for, for help here, because I'm having this intuition that I haven't fully worked through. So I have no punchline yet. But um, it strikes me that part of the conversation we've been having in this Q&A period has been about the differences between the child-parent relationship and other kinds of mm. familial relationships mm. and potentially um, different uh, types or categories of domestic violence that we might think of in, in terms of those relationships. And one thing that struck me as, as you were presenting is I'm, I, I find myself um, uh, agreeing with sort of the, the, the arguments and I find them very compelling. But it struck me that um, it's interesting to me that I have a different intuition that I can't quite explain, where yeah. when you when you speak about the fact that um, people from different cultural, ethnic, um, religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, class backgrounds may have a different uh, conceptualization of what appropriate child rearing is, that children from those backgrounds may experience physical discipline or corrective force differently. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about uh, sort of, I have more ambivalence towards sort of how that claim might cash out or should cash out. Yeah. But I feel I have a quite strong intuition yeah. that when people have tried to make kind of what we might baldly kind of classify as like cultural relativistic arguments yeah. about other types yeah. of domestic violence, right? Yeah. Where people yeah. sort of claim like in our culture, yeah. you know, there's not a requirement of uh, consent for sex in a marriage or, yeah. you know, attempts, uh, you know, in the pre in the pre sort of criminal code shift on provocation to use sort of culturally driven provocation defenses, things like that. Yeah. Right. Those get shut down quite quickly. And my sense is like rightly so that part yeah. of the role of the criminal courts is to just say, well, there's certain practices which might be sort of mainstream in particular cultures, but which are just sort of unacceptable. And perhaps that's Perhaps there's a problem with that intuition that I have, but I do have that towards yeah. something like marital rape, for example, yeah. or, or or wife beating, right? Yeah. And so I guess I'm I'm wondering yeah. if you have a sense of how you would explain. Mm. I'm assuming that you share that intuition, which perhaps you don't. But if you mm -hmm. do share that intuition, there's something categorically different there. It seems to me like the difference there cannot simply be explained by the sort of ontological difference between a child and other people in the family. That right. it's it's some it's something else about right. how we view kind of cultural context and the relevance thereof and mm. I that's as far as I can get mentally in the sort of time I've been thinking about this but yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any any reactions to that no it's a yeah it's a great question and I don't have uh and it's also one that I share and so I don't have an answer that would say you know I take this point about children potentially interpreting physical discipline differently and therefore this is my law reform proposal. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't have a, a a straight line there, and nor would I suggest it. It's it's a question though. I think is worth uh, asking uh, of social science or otherwise that hasn't yet been. I I think the one thing I would say though that, and I think this comes back to that quote that I that I read from Martha Minow, which is that. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that in a lot of these discussions about uh, culture clashes, about, you know, cult quote, cultural defenses, about uh, political clashes, uh, w you know, we can think of right now the debates that are going on uh, in Quebec. Um, uh, we tend often, though not exclusively, uh, to talk about them in terms of women's bodies, uh, women's sexuality, uh, women's coverings, women's lack of covering. Um, I really share uh, a Martha Minow. This is also something that, uh, that Janet Halley has written a little bit about, which is to say I, I share their intuition, and I don't think they offer an answer, but I really share their sense that the questions and the contests around consensus around child rearing are both more vexed and more intractable than the arguments are around women and women's bodies and women's autonomy. And I think like a starting point to try to think why that is, I, and I think again this goes to the point in Martha's quote, which is that even in, I mean she says at the end of her quote, uh, even in, uh, she says, yet any such, you know, she says the centrality of choice should make it clear 
uh, particularly this language of choice, right, which is one of these liberal, you know, women should be able to choose what they wear, don't wear. Women should obviously be able to consent whether they're going to have sex, not have sex uh, within a marriage. Um, she says uh, any uh, genuine effort to enable choice much, must focus on children. Um, but even the most fundamental freedoms, which is to reproduce and raise children, are ensured by law to individuals in Western democratic societies. I think we afford within Western democratic societies, and I know I'm kind of coming back to this difference between the two, but I think we afford through law and social practice a huge latitude of choice as to how one wants to uh, raise a child. You know, this is how linguistic traditions continue. This is how capitalism continues. Uh, this is, you know, but people reproduce in micro and macro ways through relations that are not liberal for the child. Uh, the liber the child, I think, is a uh, is a constant uh, and uh, and to my mind, completely to this point in time, an unresolved. Uh, dilemma for liberalism. You no, I, be, and and so and I think that's at the heart of why we think we have vexed debates about the marital rape and the, and the head coverings, but you can somehow kind of get your head around those if you can say, well, but in a in a Western democratic society, at least on its face, we think that all adults, including adult women, have a liberal uh, purchase on autonomy. But none of us uh, actually live at all that way about children. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah, my, my son's daycare, which I'll cease to say. But I don't have a buyout for it, yeah. yeah. No, they're, they're teaching my son to say, like, please don't touch my body in response to, like, a friend pushes him or hits him. So we sometimes right. use this at home. And it's like, sometimes, yes but sometimes we need to change that diaper, right? And so right. there's sort of like this categorization of right. when his assertion of bodily autonomy is legitimate. Right. And I should say, okay, he doesn't want to be hugged right now. I'm trying to teach right. him that that's appropriate. Right. And when it's like, we need to go, we're putting your coat on. And so I, yeah. I see like on a very sort of basic level yeah. how that works, but I haven't worked through the more yeah. uh, interesting implications of and that. And when, when he has to go to school, you're going to sit and he's going to say, I don't want to go to school today. And then you're going to start putting his coat on and physically saying, and by law, he has to be in school. Right. Um, you know, he can't just, you know, kind of laissez-faire choose it <laughs> that today's not the day. Uh, I mean, maybe he can one day, but he can't over a long period of time, right? Like his, there's so much of his life that is structured through the family and then through society. Um, and I think, I think the child's a total... Uh, is is just this really paradoxical dilemma uh, for liberalism. I think it was easier in a legal order like Blackstone when you had categories of people who you did not make any, uh, you didn't make any claim on liberal equality as between subjects. You had different types of people who were in different types of relations to one another and each had different types of legal functions and legal duties and responsibilities, that's easier to get your mind around. But once you change over to the plane of like a liberal democratic order where you all supposedly have equality and equal draws on the law and, and equal autonomy and choices, um, we, you know, the, the child is like really in quicksand immediately. And we are in terms of how we think about it. So, Thanks. So it sounds like um, the, the, uh, the, the what is it, Canadian Foundation decision yeah. sets this standard like what is it, trifling and what's the other word? Yeah. Kind of passing and trifling nature or something. Yeah. Mandatory and trifling nature. So that seems like pretty um, like there's a lot of discretion in there. And yeah. I'm wondering how far that standard is from from what you know about or what you think the standard is on the ground of people who decide to enforce and prosecutors who decide whether or not to prosecute. Because it seems mm. to me if you repeal 43, the discretion is just going to go, it's just going to be taken away from courts and it's just going to go straight, it's all going to fall on, you know, the mode of enforcement, the mode of prosecution. And, you know, we know that not every instance is going to get, yeah. you know, brought to the court's yeah. attention and not every 
since Ms. Gooding apostrophe. Yep. So I wonder if it's helpful for you in like, you know, honing your argument against repeal to map out mm. who would be differentially mm. impacted. And if you have data, like you obviously have the data from the court decisions, you, yep. you know them well, what is in and what is out yeah. based on this standard. Yeah. But how, how, can one, how could you go about determining what is, what is in and what is out and then obviously who's going to be differentially impacted? So I just thought that was one question I, I, that, that came to mind. Perfect. Um, and then the second question was, um, if you could have written uh, you know, Canada Canadian Foundation, or if you could rewrite section 43 in a way that takes into account your argument that we shouldn't be universalizing the child, universalizing parenting, yeah. what, like what kind of language could we include in such a standard that takes more into account those contextual factors? Um, because, um, like, I think that's a real challenge, and I think that would be really interesting to think through. Because I, I think that's a really powerful critique that you make about the advocacy about social science evidence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and then you, you've shown us, well, like, courts, you know, like, wrestle with that. Um, and kind of weasel, you know, they, they say it's not definitive, but we're going to treat yeah. it as causal. Like, yeah. like, and so how, how, could, how could law in a very statutory or judicial formulate, form, formulated way actually translate what I think is a very valid, valid you know, uh, epistemological concern that you have about the nature of social science evidence. So that's the second question. And the third question is just maybe related to that second question about, about legal education or how we would train advocates, right? So if you're not the judge or the legislature, but you're the advocate, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you have advocated differently knowing the granularity and the complicated context of the social science e evidence? And, and um, how, how do you think advocates or legal scholars who have the ability to really think through that complicated nature, how would, how would, we, how would we help guide legislators and courts who are kind of charged with the responsibility of drawing those more bright lines? Anyways, you don't have to answer any of those on the spot, but I yeah. just, just three questions. Great. No, this is great. I'll just say a couple of short things on each because they're big questions, but great. Um, the first is on the police uh, prosecution point. Um, so I think that's absolutely right that often when you... Um, that there's this, you know, you see sometimes in the criminal scholarship, this hydro this theory of hydraulic effects within the criminal systems, almost if you think of them as different systems, that if you shift discretion uh, away, you know, we saw this in sentencing reform, say in the US, if you shift toward or wherever, you know, you pull the discretion away from the judge, let's say on sentencing, uh, does it simply go somewhere else in the system, right? And then maybe you get prosecutors who then hold immense power to charge stack, uh, and that they end up being able to use uh, differential sentencing uh, uh, moves. So, you know, discretion, you don't eliminate it, you move it to. So I, I and I share that. Uh, I'm com I find that view very compelling, and I think that is what would happen, and it's a nice point. I don't actually make that in the, the paper right now. So actually, uh, I, that's a really nice point that I should make a little bit more of. Uh, and I do think it would shift earlier in the process. Um, I haven't done any uh, empirical research right now on this. There has been one, at least one set of empirics, and I should follow up to see if they've done more on this. I can't, uh, I think it's, it's a criminologist at U of T, uh, but I can't recall their name right now. And they did a study of policing of physical discipline cases post-Canadian Foundation. What was really interesting is that they, and this is probably unsurprising once one says it and thinks about it a little bit, um, they found pretty, very significant regional disparities of, um, of charges flowing from what they think were pretty commensurate cases of hitting children. Uh, and they found the lowest, so they compared, um, I believe it was Saskatoon, but it could be Winnipeg. It was either, it was coming out of Sask Saskatchewan or Manitoba, let's say Winnipeg for argument's sake. Um, and then I think somewhere like Hamilton and Toronto. Uh, and they found the uh, highest charge rates for hitting in Toronto, uh, median being somewhere like Hamilton, and your lowest being in the prairies. Uh, and then one could theorize about how there might be different regional 
uh, understandings and consensus or lack around consensus uh, amongst policed forces about whether physical discipline should translate uh, and actually end up translating into a charge. Um, so I think that's also an issue of concern where your geography, your, you know, your place in a particular urban setting as, urban setting as well um, may have an effect on, on that. Um, you know, for the most part, advocates have said, look, we should rely on good faith discretion. And they made that point in Canadian Foundation of police and prosecutors. Um, you know, I, I think to be a kind of a skeptic or a realist, uh, it, it depends what type of a person you are, how much you want to put dis faith in discretion of the police or your fo or their forces, right? Uh, and and if you're an African Canadian family living in parts of Toronto, um, I don't know that I'd be putting banking my money onto police faith uh, as I would maybe myself at Whole Foods or whatever, right? Uh, but you there there is a mar there is a regional disparity which I think is interesting. I think it would be a great area for more work. Um, uh, uh, the second point, just quickly, what would I have done in, in Canadian Foundation or the code? I mean, I don't have a code suggestion other than clarifying it at the very least for the language of Canadian Foundation. I think that's helpful that people should know the state of the law. The TRC maybe didn't, uh, maybe should be aware that it doesn't apply to teachers. That could be spelled out very clearly and that could be helpful for everybody. Um, uh, but I do think it would have been, I, I, I do think and I think there's a reason why the court didn't signal these, these differences, uh, race, class, otherwise, because I think it's, um, I think the language, the progressive language of saving children, of protecting children, uh, I think is very seductive. I think it's very, very morally powerful. Uh, and I think it's ideologically powerful. And I think if you had to admit that within that, uh, that a lot of that is, uh, is inflected by issues of class and poverty, um, that would be a different, in that would be a difficult institutional reality with which any of these big players are going to want to address. You know, they certainly said, look, Vinny said uh, it will be a problem if the police are in your homes too much. Um, but uh, they didn't delve into that. And, you know, as a big, you know, as an institutional power in Canada, is it that surprising? Probably not. But I would have, had I been, you know, uh, there, wanted to see more of that because I think it would have made, it would have put everyone on notice that at the very least we shouldn't be discussing this absent those markers, given that they structure it so clearly, right? I think it's a little in bad faith, frankly, to discuss it without those markers. Um, and on the last point about legal education, I think it's a great one. Um, I mean, in my criminal law teaching, I, I talk a lot when I introduce, you know, Malmo and Levine, Bedford, all of those, that we are definitely in a moment where you know, historically in the criminal law, when you had the Hart-Devlin debate that you kind of had moralists who uh, argued about the criminal law serving certain moral functions. Uh, maybe you had the harm principle people arguing about the limits. I certainly, and this is something Harcourt and others have written about, I think we're certainly in a moment where you're in a bit of a harm free for all. Uh, on any of these high stakes contentious issues, whether it's assisted dying, prostitution, um, uh, um, indecency, uh, you have people making arguments both ways about harm. You have feminists within themselves who are making cross-cutting harm arguments and both are relying who, you know, if the common man used to be the voice of morality, at the time of like Devlin, like, you know, the, the man on the, uh, the clap and bus or whatever, you kind of take a test, like what, how much can our society withstand? If it's more than that, criminalize it. Today, if we're in these harm free-for-alls, our person is the expert. Uh, we, we see harms revealed and ex explicated uh, through expertise. And I think that uh, that's a profound shift away from uh, ideas of judges kind of taking a community standards touch on things like physical discipline, which is how they resolve the schooling. When they can't do that or aren't doing that anymore, they go to the expert. The expert tells us what's harmful and how it's harmful. And then we make legal arguments about what reform we should draw from that. I think it's really, I, I try to really emphasize that for my students. And I think then that gives them a sense of what's at stake. Uh, with uh, with drawing different experts who, you know, in Bedford it was a big problem for the Crown that many of their experts, 
had been involved in prostitution abolition advocacy and research, and that really undermines some of, you know, there are lots of these things then that you have to look at really carefully, um, but it is, it, it is the way that we solve high stakes constitutional and criminal constitutional or just constitutional in general litigation today. And students have to be really uh, aware of that. And it's not a neutral exercise. It's not just, you know, give me the, I think progressives like to say, we turn to evidence and now we've gotten away from ideological moralizing. But I think everybody should be honest that, you know, we're, we're all doing different things and asking different questions and making political choices when we uh, look at expertise and translate it into law. So that's kind of one of the things I try to do a bit in my criminal teaching. So um, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, <laughs> thank you so much on uh, behalf of Osgood and the Nathanson Center for coming today. And if thank you'd all you. join me in thanking Professor Kelly. Thanks for coming.